is just loading now, so I hope everyone can see my slide, uh, my screen okay. Uh, so, perfect. Yeah, good morning, everyone. So, my name is Amanda Davis. Um, I'm a member of the Office of the Sport Business Commissioners team, um, the casework team, basically. Um, and I'm going to give you a short presentation on what we do and how we try to help small businesses. So, um, can you just, is it just one slide showing at the moment? Because I've just. Yeah, we've currently just got the what we do slide up. That, that's fine, yeah. sorry, because I can see more than that here. So, um, so for those of you who don't know about us, we're an independent public body set up by the government under the Enterprise Act 2016 to tackle late and unfair payment practices in the private sector. So we're a small team. We've been in operation since December 2017 and we cover England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. So what do we do at the Office of Small Business Commissioner? We help small businesses with less than 50 employees to resolve payment disputes with the large business uh, customers which have more than 50 employees. This dispute must not be subject to or have been previously determined by the court process. Uh, if legal action has started, unfortunately, we cannot help. Um, the late payment must have commenced no later than 12 months from today's date, and the large company must be based in the United Kingdom. So we aim to encourage a culture change in payment practices and how businesses deal with each other. The casework team will try to resolve disputes by investigating the unpaid uh, invoices by contacting the relevant person involved or the chief finance officer of the respondent company to discuss the reasons for non-payment and attempt to resolve the dispute. To date we've recovered over eight and a half million in late payments for small businesses and the amount that we can recover can range from £49 to £5 million or more. Uh, we provide support and guidance on how to prepare invoices with additional self-help tools which are available on our website. Uh, we also support small businesses who are experiencing issues that fall outside the remit of the Office of the Small Business Commissioner by signposting to existing support and dispute resolution services. For example, we use Business Support Helpline quite a lot as well. So, the Office of the uh, Small Business Commissioner is impartial, free to use on a non-risk basis and independent, but we are appointed uh, by government. So here are some statistics about small businesses in the United Kingdom. These stats have been taken from the Federation of Small Businesses website and the gov.uk website. This shows just how relevant and important small businesses are. There are currently five and a half million small businesses in the United Kingdom with less than 50 employees. 1.4 million of these employees and 4.1 million have no employees. This means that the company owner is the only person who works for that business. There is 1.6 trillion estimated turnover in the small business uh, sector and 96% of small businesses in the private sector have not to nine employees. At the start of 2023, London and the southeast of England had the most private sector businesses, accounting for 34% of the UK business population. Our biggest impediment to small business growth, the late payment is the biggest impediment to small business growth. 52% of small businesses in the United Kingdom are owed money from late payment or long payment terms. Standard payment terms, unless otherwise stated in a contract, are 30 days for small businesses with less than 50 employees and 60 days for large businesses with more than 50 employees. There is 24 billion worth of invoices that are unpaid to small businesses at any given time. 27% of small businesses experience delays of over two months. 20% of small businesses have run into cash flow problems due to late payments and late payment result in 50,000 businesses no longer trading each year. Hopefully with our support, guidance or self-help tools that we provide on our website, we can help small businesses overcome late payment and small businesses can thrive. So why should small businesses use our services? Well, we provide a free service, free resources and guidance, which is available on our website. The resources we have can be negotiation tips before signing the contract with a business. 
how to deal with an unpaid invoice and the next steps that you can take before legal action and many more. We have a free and easy to use late payment interest calculator also on our website. The interest calculator is a popular tool we have on our website. It has a step by step guide on how to use the calculator, a breakdown of all the amounts and how to raise separate invoice for interest and compensation. We provide a designated caseworker to manage your complaint or inquiry from beginning to end. And we will support you throughout the complaint process to resolution. We really encourage feedback from companies that we've helped that we can use as testimonials on our website so that other small businesses can see what we've done and can use this if necessary. And if the complaint is out of scope, we will sign post to the relevant body. Yeah. Unfortunately, we do receive complaints from the following sectors that we would have to sign post as they fall outside our remit due to legislation. Um, this could be government, council, NHS, any public body you can think of and they would fall under the remit of the Public Procurement Review Service, which falls within the Cabinet Office. There's construction. The construction section falls under the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act 1998, and therefore is outside our remit. In the event of a dispute, it should be stated in a contract the adjudication process that should be taken and how to proceed with that process. And then the small to small businesses, Unfortunately, the only support for small to small businesses, both with less than 50 employees, is to seek uh, independent legal advice or use a small claims court. Um, however, there is a cost for court fees. Um, more information on the court process can be found on the gov.uk website. Again, we are unable to help small to small due to legislation. So how to contact us in relation to the Office of the Small Business Commissioner? So we have separate email addresses for inquiries and complaints. We would ask if initial contact can be made by email. Uh, we also have a website containing further contact information. We have LinkedIn and Twitter pages and they have regular updates which small businesses can follow. We also, um, <clears throat> the Office of Small Business also administers the prompt payment codes which is a voluntary code of practices for businesses, and, and that's on behalf of the Department for Business and Trade. So what is the prompt payment code? Uh, it's a voluntary code of practice for businesses administered by the Office of Small Business Commissioner on behalf of the uh, Department for Business and Trade. The code was established in December 2008 and set standards for payment practices between organisations of any size and their suppliers. Uh, the ethos of the code. So the ethos is to pay suppliers on time within agreed terms by paying 95% of all invoices within 60 days and 95% of invoices from businesses with fewer than 50 employees within 30 days. Uh, it gives clear guidance to suppliers on terms, dispute resolution and prompt notification of late payment. We support good practice throughout the supply chain by encouraging adoption of the code. And currently we have 4,803 signatories on our prompt payment code. So we would welcome any application from any business that can meet the code criteria, either, uh, whether they are big or small. And you can apply to become a signatory by completing an application form, which can be found on our website. So you can contact us in relation to the prompt payment code as follows. Again, it's um, by email. You can telephone us. We have a website and also you can follow us on Twitter. So um, that's that's me. Um, so I'd just like to end the presentation with a massive thank you uh, for listening today. And I really hope if you didn't know about us and what we do at the Office of Small Business Commission, that you uh, obviously found this presentation informative and please contact us should you have any queries or uh, any any disputes at all that we can help you with oh excellent thank you amanda thank you so much for joining us as always um and um you can even stay on the on the call if, if, if that's what you want to do in terms of you know i could pick up some questions at the end yeah, or you know we can share your slides if that's okay as well that's with all fine. the participants
Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much, everybody. Okay, let's move on then. We shall move on to John Acton from Peer to Peer. Good morning to you, John. I'm looking forward to your session as always. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks. Okay, I'll share my screen in a moment. Thanks, uh, Matt, for inviting me, and thanks, Amanda, for teeing it up brilliantly. Um, I wasn't expecting that. It's absolutely perfect setting up of what we're about to talk about. So, a um, bit of background. I, I met Matt some time ago and um, shared with him that we've got um, something we call Capability Compass, which is a whole raft of, of, of training and leadership material um, around eight points of the compass. Um, finance is one of them, but you've got innovation, strategic thinking, growth. Um, what else have we got on there? We've got brand and culture, productivity. Uh, da, 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 what have I missed? Finance, growth, brand and culture. Yeah, that's and, and governance. And basically, the principle being to run a business, you've got to be kind of good, good or at least competent at all of these things. So, uh, Matt very kindly chose finance, which is absolutely not my area. So, if I can deliver this, it'll be a miracle. Um, because I wrote, I write most of our stuff, but Tim, who's an ex-partner at BDO, wrote this one. So um, anyway, but uh, it's it's a it's a, a bit of a dry topic, but as you've heard, it's really really important now more so than ever, right? So what we're trying to do today is is simplify it, and 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 so that you guys uh, understand, uh, go away with some a better understanding that actually there are things you can do. Um, and maybe some some golden nuggets that might come from the room, not just from me, right? Um, so obviously I'll, I'll keep one eye on the on the hand. Please stop and ask questions throughout. Of course, I'm going to break break points within the um, the next hour um, to throw it out to you guys to potentially discuss your own thoughts on it. Okay, because I don't want it just me me talking. That'd be very boring. Okay, so I'm going to try and make it a little bit interactive as well. So without further conversation i will share my screen so hopefully you can see manage your credit control and our old brand there in the top right hand corner um okay so uh let me just walk you through what this workshop's all about um matt just a quick question have we shared this pdf with everybody oh sorry you're on matt you're on mute matt Sorry, yeah, we shared it on our original platform, but we had to change at the last minute, so it hasn't been hasn't been shared. I can email it to everybody this instant; it's not a problem. Um, but we couldn't because we went from go to webinar to Teams um, okay. over two day period. Do you want me to share it with everybody now? Yeah, I want everybody to have a copy. They don't need it; they can just watch the screen and make their own notes. Uh, but it'd be great okay. if everybody's got a copy of it um, at least after this to to walk away with. Um, yeah, no. Yeah, no. OK, so the purpose of this of the next hour is to help you assess your own credit control processes and identify ways to manage your credit control more effectively. OK, uh, the goal is that within the next six months, you could make that three months or two months, you streamline your processes to improve your your cash flow, cash is king and all that, improve your, your profitability and reduce the, the, the if you like the burden of late paying on your business um, because you know this this overused expression is it overused no it's not actually um cash is king it absolutely is king because you know um i make for my business we make a point of paying uh invoices to our suppliers the moment they land regardless of what the, the payment terms are that's just our own policy for the first month ever we've not been able to do that because because we're we're, we're having our customers are late paying us which is holding us up. So it, it's, it, it is an absolute domino, this whole topic. And the more uh, the big companies um, pay back to Amanda's point and the code, then the trickle effect and the impact on the economy is enormous, right? But over the next hour, I'm gonna walk you through some of the, the areas where we think you might be able to tighten the nuts on the bike, if you like, and, and make your bike go faster, okay? OK, so we start off with what's the strategic problem? So I'll just explain that. Assess your own situation. Um, we're trying to break it down into people, process and controls. More about that in a moment. And then hopefully by the end of this, 
you've got the some sort of points you can put together into into kind of an actionable plan. That's what we try to do. Okay, so what's the strategic problem? Cash flow is the lifeblood, as I've said, and thriving businesses recognise the key part that effective cash control plays in their success, but particularly during challenging times and difficult times, because um, you want to you don't want to stifle your own growth because you don't have the cash to invest in growing your business. Ultimately, severe cash flow difficulties can lead to ultimate business closure. So um, uh, a friend of mine was struck by this very same problem. Um, he won uh, all sorts of business awards and then um, within 12 months of winning an award, he had to close his business because he had a major client that was 25% of his turnover went bust. And this major client owed him several hundred thousand, right? And ultimately he tried to survive, but in, in the end he had to close the business down, okay? So that's a real life story of somebody quite close to me who's been called out by, um, yeah, by not keeping a, a tight control on, on the cash flow. Okay, so what we try to do here is, is break it down into three core areas. There's the people aspect. What can your people do? to help with this challenge. Then there's the process and then there's some control. So let's take each one of these in turn. OK, so for people, whether you're you know, a one man band or you've got 20, 30 employees, um, it's important to get everybody involved in in the um, in the role that they have to play in in improving um, credit control and improving the flow of cash. Right. So clarify the roles and responsibilities for all those in your organization. Right. Including, for example, let's say you've got two salespeople. Right. So they're selling your products and services to your customers and it's your customers that pay you. Right. So it's your customers that we're talking about here. So in the sales process, are they clear up front about the payment terms that you offer? If you're providing a service, for example, and let's say your service is uh, training and you go in and do some training. Once you've delivered the training, they've got the 100 percent the benefit of what they've bought. But if they don't pay you for 30 days, there's a vulnerability there because you've got no zero leverage. Right. So perhaps, you know, your salespeople should be trained and perhaps your T's and C should say it's 50% on signature and 50% before the training is delivered. Therefore, you get paid 100% before you've delivered the training to the client. So that's something to think about in terms of the role sales can play in reinforcing from day one what your customer, uh, what your expectations are of the customer, right? Have they received the appropriate skills and training, right? So if we if we fly through this workshop, I've got another one pager at the end, if we've got time, uh, which we call nailing difficult conversations. Right. And that something as simple as that can make a massive difference. We all hate asking people to pay us money. We hate it. It's not something we're naturally comfortable with, but we should be. We should be because at the end of the day, the customer has signed up to your T's and C's. They've, they've signed up and agreed to pay in 30 days, in seven days, in 14 days, whatever they might be, regardless of what their own policies are, right? So um, I'm going to go off on a tangent just for a moment, but touching on what Amanda talked about earlier. I did some work um, uh, three years ago with a, uh, a major logistics company. It's a household name, right? International logistics company. And they had their standard payment terms are 90 days, right? But mine are 30 days. So we had a bit of an impasse. And I was dealing with the CEO and I said, it's 30 days, otherwise we're not going to do this. And he agreed to make an exception and do it on 30 days. So they signed the, the proposal and everything was fantastic. When the 30 days came and they hadn't paid, I gave it 10 more days and then I chased the finance department. They came back to me and said, we, you need a purchase order. 
You need your sponsor to have given you a purchase order. We can't start the process until we have a purchase order. I said, well, nobody said that to me. And, and so I sent a, a note to the CEO saying, I need a purchase order, apparently. And, and he said, oh, yeah, that's my bag. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a purchase order. So he gave me a purchase order. I resubmitted the invoice. And guess what? They started the clock again. Right? And uh, I eventually got paid in 100 days. 100 days. Because they had, and, and what was really interesting, at the time it didn't really matter to us, but because we were we were we were we were quite sort of cash buoyant at the time. It was it was pre-COVID, so I guess it was four years ago. Anyway, I had dinner with the CEO after we delivered the training, we did the review, we did an anniversary review, and I challenged him about this, and um, and and I, put, I reminded him what his values were, and yet there. They incentivize their payment um, finance director gets bonused on stretching out payments as long as possible. And that contravenes their whole values, their culture and everything. But it's what that guy was incentivized. And it can be as simple as the CEO saying, actually, we've got this wrong. We need to change the way we operate. So, sorry, I went down a rabbit warren there, but I think it's, um, I think it's a nice little anecdote about um, how large companies can behave and watch out for the purchase order one, right? Adequate resourcing is the next one. Um, whether you're using an in-house team or you're outsourcing, make sure you have the appropriate resource. Now, a bit later on, on the people thing, think about who is responsible for credit control, right? Because some best practices, you decouple it from finance department. So finance create the billing, the invoicing and so on, but potentially, and they want to maybe, you know, the classic cliche, good cop, bad cop, maybe allow them to continue to be good cop and have someone else responsible for credit control and chasing the debt. It's just a thought. So think about who is who who fulfills what role specifically. Finally, to achieve and maintain awareness of the importance of credit control in all parts of the business, not just finance, to make it if you have town hall meetings, right? with all your team or you've got a weekly or a monthly SMT, a senior management team meeting, or depending on how big your company are, or whatever your governance uh, approach is, you know, try put it on the agenda. Put it on the agenda, not every month, but maybe every other month to, to keep banging that drum that everybody has a role to play in this and, and <clears throat> make sure everybody's clear what their role is. Yeah, From the front end sales right the way through cradle to grave, when, when a company's exit, exited, make sure they exit in the right way. Make sure all, de all uh, outstanding debts are recovered, etc. Okay, so the next um, sort of part of the Holy Trinity is, is process, right? So successful business, you need an effective process before, during and after sales of your products or service to ensure that the client understands exactly what their role is in this, yeah? So the, the earlier you make them aware of your payment terms and the implications on late payments and the incentives you might have if they pay if they pay up front and so on, you may want to introduce go cardless or direct debit. More about that later, because there's pros and there's pluses and minuses with that. Um, robust written procedures. So uh, this is with your T's and C's. Make sure it's nice and clear. There's no ambiguity. Right? There's no grey areas. Um, you don't have different payment terms for different clients. Yeah, because that makes it complicated and you don't want to complicate it unnecessarily. Yeah. Um, written procedures as well for each stage when it goes wrong, when you first point of escalation, second point of escalation and so on. Um, I don't know how many of you are, are into sort of CRM and automations and so on, but have you, you know, well-crafted, well-prepared uh, emails um, so that you've you've got them ready to use uh, as and when needed for each stage of whatever your process might be. Okay, review your processes regularly. You know that's tied into one of the examples we've got right at the end in Appendix Two, where we have a real live potential example. Um, and I'll come on to that at the end, but you um, 
you know, do your debt a day exercise uh, regularly, maybe two, three, four times a year and set yourself a target on what you want to try and get it down to and put an action plan in place on how you can improve the process to bring those debt a days down. OK, third section is about control. You know, successful businesses need you know, to have the processes, but also stick to those processes and have the relevant controls in place. So relevant, timely management information that excludes exception reporting and KPI. So I mentioned debt days. I'll go into a bit more detail on that later on. Um, but you yourself know, hopefully um, many of you will use platforms like Xero or QuickBooks, Free Agent and so on. These are great to help you understand, <coughs> pardon me, who are the late payers? Um, and and to maybe have those conversations sooner rather than later. You can track uh, and group your clients in terms of, you know, the, the early payers, you know, the gold clients that pay on time, those that stick to, those that are, you know, habitual um, problems and maybe have a, a conversation with them. Maybe the conversations linked to price that because they consistently pay beyond 30 days, um from january the first the price is going to be current price plus ten percent right um you know the use use whatever levers you might have early warning indicators um really important and um, make sure you've got back to the people point make sure you've got somebody responsible to monitor those early warning things so if you outsource your finances to a bookkeeper for example Maybe it's you outsource this where they flag with you based on on uh, maybe they do a debt a day exercise every every two months and identify who your um, clients of concern might be. Um, check regularly the processes have been agreed upon are being stuck to and implemented correctly. OK, um, final point here to monitor the amount of funding required to allow the forecast level of sales on their standard credit terms and, and the impact on changes. And the good example here is because higher say, sales volume or sales forecasts can lead to slower payment and you may have cash flow challenges. So, um, you know, beware the golden goose, right? Beware the the big stellar client that you've been after for ages who wants 60 day payment terms. Think about the impact on your cash flow, because if, for example, you're providing them with a product and you've got to buy in extra working capital, you're going to tie up some of your cash in working capital that you've never had to before because you've got to buy your, your raw materials to do your production to that. And then there's a ripple, but it's compounded because you've now got 25% of your revenue is now on, going to be 60 days. So try and forecast your cash and do a cash flow forecast. And if you're unsure how to do that, you know, bookkeeper, your accountant can help you do that. OK, there are uh, plenty of publicly available um, um, uh, tools and platforms to help you with that. OK, so that's a quick whistle stop tour. What I want you to do now, this is this is where you do some work, right? I want you to. Be honest and score yourself out of 10, 10 being outstanding, right? If it's if it's not relevant for you, just give yourself a middle score, five or six, right? Um, and then if it's if you actually you recognize oh, we're not great there, then give yourself a lower score. So I just want to give you maybe two or three minutes to go through this form. Um, I think it's been sent to you, so you might want to. Two minutes, send it to your printer. Um, so we are now 10.39. I'm going to give you five minutes to run off to the printer um, and then fill that in. And then what I'd like to do is I'm going to ask for a volunteer to share. And if you're not a volunteer, you'll be voluntold. I'll come and pick on somebody, right? So um, I'll give you five minutes. Morning, everybody. Everybody's been emailed um, the booklet uh, from, from John, and it's also in the chat box. Feel free to access that. Thank you.
John, uh, just so you know, I just muted you very quickly. We were getting some pretty bad feedback from your microphone. You should be able to unmute yourself, I think, at any point. Sorry about that. Right, how are we doing, everybody? We, um, uh, I can't work, I'm not very good with teams, so I can't work out. Matt, if you've got everybody on screen, if you can flag if somebody's... Do I have a volunteer? Matt, you're my spotter. Yep. Feel free to raise your hand and I will let John know. So, so just to share their, their, their view, having um, just gone through these uh, people process control. Becky. We have a volunteer, John. We have a volunteer. Becky Turner is going to volunteer for us. Thank you so much. Becky, um, this, is, this is quite good for me because I'm recently moved into this new role. So this is quite a nice little test for me to flag whether I'm, you know, I'm doing the right thing or um, it's raised some questions for me as well, which is, which is really helpful. So thank you. Um, what do you want me to do? Just go through my scores? Yeah, Becky, first of all, can you just tell us about your business? What's your role? And, and then walk us through your score. OK, so um, we're a sort of an outsourced IT company. Um, so we would be like your IT department, if you like, if you're a smaller business. Um, and also for equally for larger businesses as well, if they need additional resource for sort of break fix and um, on site days, things like that. Right, OK, brilliant. Uh, the role I play now, I've just moved into finance, I was project management um, and now I'm sort of taking on a, a project management role internally to help streamline um, our finance team and their processes. OK, brilliant. Right. So go on then. Share share with us your assessment. Um, OK, so I've, I've just numbered them one to four in the, under the people section. So um, I gave us a seven for the first one. Um, and that's purely down to that we've recently taken on sort of new roles within the team. So we've we've split what their roles are. We've we've got one person now purely doing the sales side and one person doing doing the purchase side. So there's a little bit of training that still needs to be um, given. OK. Um, two, I've done uh, given us a six. Um, what have I put? Not had access. We've not had the access all the time for for the skills. The, the team that we've had in before, they've been quite busy, sort of chasing their tails, um, and they haven't had anyone there that they can sort of lean upon or ask for guidance. Um, which hopefully we can we can change for them. Okay, brilliant. Maybe come, um, back. come back to that one. Yeah, yeah, because you. Uh, do you have some thoughts about what sort of skills and training they might need? Um, I think we've got, we've got, it's only a small team, there's just, just three of us. Um, and I think it's just direction, mainly. Um, there's, there's also um, a member of our team who's quite keen to learn more, which we want to be able to support them to do. Um, and we have a sort of an external accountant that helps us, but it's having it's having access to that person or or being able to give up the time to allow them to train um, but we want to make sure that we get the base right first and we and we do all our day-to-day -day jobs before we suddenly run off and learn new skills we want to just sort of bring things back to basics and and get our finance team running smoothly first brilliant okay and suitable resourcing yeah, we've got, I think we've got the right people in the right seats now. Um, the team is is big enough. There's there's enough work to keep them busy. Um, I think perhaps utilisation. We could. I think we do a lot of procrastinating, um, and we've got a few things that sit in a too, diff too difficult pile, which we're trying to to get down now. Um, that will free up some time, and we're also looking to bring in some more automation, which will free up free up time for the team as well. Brilliant. Um, um, the final. And the, uh, yeah, sorry. The awareness of importance of credit control. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, I think I've given us a nine there. Everybody knows the importance of it. Brilliant. Okay. What about process? 
Um, seven for the first one. I don't think sales don't like to muddy the waters, um, which we find in our, our team. Um, they're, they're aware that there is sometimes issues with credit control and payment but they like to separate it so they just they're quite keen to, to take the client on and, and keep things um they don't like having difficult conversations before they've signed on the dotted line yeah um and that sort of flows into the second one as well i've given us a seven there right okay um, and then three, I've I've given us an eight, um, but I think actually looking at this now, it might be a good, there might be a step that we could add in as a finance team when there is a new client that we've onboarded, just to sort of introduce ourselves, build that relationship with their finance team, um, talk about setting up direct debit. I know you're going to cover that later, um, but just sort of setting the scene early on. Um, that is a role that potentially our finance team could take on. Yeah, brilliant. OK, and um, and control. Um, so the first one I've got, what is it, relevance? Yeah, I mean, we've got zero. So the information is available to us at, at any time. Um, we've got one person that kind of looks at, at zero at the money coming in and then a separate person that does credit control. Um, whether we're utilising it effectively, I'm not sure. It's still early days. Um, I haven't actually got access to zero. So once I, I get that, it will be easier for me to sort of to dive a little bit deeper into. Um, the second one I've given us is seven. Um, we see who are early, like the early warning indicators. But again, it's a question for us as a team to answer. What are we doing about it? Um, I don't know whether it's advisable to put accounts on hold. I don't know what the process is for that. That's a new thing for me. Um, but we do have some clients that tend to delay payments and and what is the knock on effect to putting them on hold and the service that we're delivering to, to get payment from them. I don't know, That's maybe that's a question you can help us with. Um, yeah. The third one is, I've given us an eight, so we're we're really good at, Producing an age debt report, chasing clients, um, you know, daily credit control, getting payment dates and following up on that. Um, and then I've given us an eight because I believe we've got, you know, the appropriate funding in place. I don't know if I've been a bit harsh on us or whether I've been, I don't know. I don't know whether those scores are what you're expecting, but it's been quite interesting. Yeah, no, I think, uh, thank you, first off, Becky, I think, you know, thank you for your honesty. Um, and obviously, it's early days for you. You might yeah. read these scores, you know, in two months' time and might have a, a different view on some of them. I think it's an exercise we should try and and, and repeat periodically um, and try and obviously get as many of the the uh, six and sevens up to nine and ten and, and, and vice versa. Your, your, your comment about sales being reluctant it, it's i don't think there's an organization on the planet where sales hate having that difficult conversation um, yeah chase it because they're afraid that it'll damage the relationship and the customer won't buy or they'll go somewhere else that's uh, exactly right so so they avoid it so it's about enabling sales to have that conversation where they're more carrying the message yeah, or, or perhaps introduce the finance person or the credit control person to the conversation. So they're sort of um, not seen by the customers that as being the messenger and, and therefore get shooting the messenger. But um, it's all part of a process. So good organisations will have a bit like Velcro. You'll have multiple connections with the client, multiple hooks into the client, not just the sales hook. So. Um, you might, for example, with important clients, have a, a relationship between the finance team, the invoicing department, and their payment, the payments team, so that the actual conversation um, is between two finance people, one who pays bills and one who, who chases payment, rather than the salesperson and the customer. Um, so th there's all sorts of things you could try and explore there. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's such a sales have got the most important part in this arguably 
in that they they've got the um the the most obvious relationship with the customer and therefore they've got a key role to play in trying to reduce any um cash flow challenges as a result of each client okay we'll come back to some of the points you raised when we get into appendix one and two at the end but thanks thanks for sharing that right i want to go to the next page which is basically um okay so um what have i learned from a becky's sort of um sharing with but also now you've had a chance to reflect on that are there some obvious issues and actions you think you might be able to take now what i'm going to ask you to do is, is not fill that in now you can make a start but as we progress in the next 20 minutes through the rest of the workbook you might want to jump back to that page and jot some things down right because this is basically okay these are the ideas how you might be able to improve the people area the process area and we've split process into before sale time of sale and after sale right because particularly with the service industry where you're providing a service that kind the timing issue might be quite important so uh, an example for um, our business for example we we done we we run strategy reset retreats for clients and and there can be if there's a lot of people involved quite a high ticket item let's say 20k and um, we insist on 50% on signature and 50%, the remaining 50%, the day before the workshop is delivered. Because the once the workshop happens, all the value is extracted. I sort of mentioned this earlier. So I think with some businesses, it might be an issue to, to break out process into the three stages, pre, during, post sale. And then finally, the control bit. So pages four, uh, sorry, five and six, Keep coming back to that to jot your ideas down and your thoughts and your observations. OK, this section here is basically for you to complete maybe tomorrow. We have a rule called the 72 hour rule, where basically once you've been through one of our trainings, you know, if you try and get your action plan done within the next 72 hours or it won't happen. Right. So this is something to happen uh, for you to think about who should be involved in the company, in your business, when. And is it something I definitely should, DSM is definitely should do, maybe. Definitely should do, maybe. Okay. So more about that uh, later on, perhaps, when I'm wrapping up. Right. Now, what I want to do now is walk you through some, some uh, terminology and some thoughts. This might flush out some ideas, right? And, and um, Matt, if you just could keep an eye on the... Um, uh, hand raising bit for me um, and interrupt me if somebody's got a question that would be great because in this section it's actually probably better to ask the questions as we go okay so some ideas that we've got and this is not an exhaustive list right um, I'm sure you can come up with uh, some others and maybe some of the people on this call have got some great ideas that they deploy which are really effective for them okay so first one um, kind of obvious but agree the terms up front exactly decide as a business how you want to play this um yeah it, it, it and this can be very industry specific it can be business specific so if you've got significant outlay in order to provide the product or the service you might want to consider payment up front particularly uh, in, in in your t's and c's try not to bespoke t's and c's try and have standard t's and c's which you apply across all your customers okay so undertake due diligence on the prospect this is basically you can do credit checks you can um, do standard inquiries see if they've got any ccjs against them so common sense housekeeping is always a good starting point set the terms of supply for all customers and clients to ensure they know what they are so for example whether there's a credit limit a degree of tolerance in terms of a credit limit, what that credit limit is, how often is that credit limit reviewed? Yeah. Okay. Payment terms. Um, so try and be consistent about this. Net monthly. Um, this is basically. So I'll give you an example to illustrate what net monthly is. Let's say the invoice is dated the fifteenth of July. Net monthly means that it's 
one month after the end of the month of the invoice. So 15th of July, the payment is due on the 31st of August. OK, that's what net monthly means. 30 days, kind of obvious, it's 30 days from the date of the invoice. OK, seven days, 14 days, you know, pick something, stick to it. You might want to, um, there's a trade off here. Sales might say that if we had 60 days, I can get this client across the line. That's down to you as a, as a leadership team to discuss the pros and cons of having exceptions like that. OK. Um, uh, review credit limits regularly, at least quarterly for all your existing clients. The rhythm of that may be appropriate depending on your industry and the exposure. OK, reinforce payment terms on your invoices in your statements. So have bold on your invoice payment terms strictly seven days, payment str terms strictly 30 days, right? On your statements. Um, next section, keeping records. Obviously, um, we've mentioned zero um, and QuickBooks and so on. That's a great uh, help to have a platform like that to manage your whole, all your customers. You, you may have a CRM system that you deploy. You can obviously, um, you know, stitch those together so you've got a holistic view of the customer. OK, uh, very important. Um, it's important that you've got the, the contact details of, of who you need to to uh, to be speaking to at the customer. Um, and and if you've got if you have to, it was mentioned earlier in Becky's uh, uh, thing about about going nuclear. My words, not not hers. I'll come on to that later on in terms of who should be involved in that discussion before you you effectively potentially put a client on stop or or equivalent. OK, so record keeping is important. Ensure your account systems can report quickly. Um, you know, in as good to real time as possible. Right. Um, I use zero. Um, um, the the guys responsible here for uh, our, our billing are much better at it than I am, and they need to be because they're the ones who, who, who will flag to me if we've got any clients that we should be concerned about. Invoicing. Agree on the invoicing uh, basis, you know, whether it's invoicing on delivery, on completion of a service, um, where there's a split invoice, 50% up front, et cetera, as we talked about. Um, this should be fixed in advance um, with, with pre-agreed uh, intervals. You know, maybe it's in stage, you break the payment down into, into um, portions and so on. Um, invoice promptly and, and consistently. So whether your invoices go out the first of every month or the last day of every month, you know, be consistent and don't deviate from that. Um, I've already mentioned include payment options if it's if it's appropriate to do so. Uh, payment, encourage immediate payment. Um, I mentioned earlier about go cardless. There's an upside and a downside to go cardless and direct debit. Direct debit, if you do a price increase, for example, it means all your customers have to manually adjust their direct debit to take account of that price increase. Go Cardless is much easier to apply a price increase across the Go Cardless platform. They've got various tier charging. It's a bit counterintuitive. The charging can increase with the number of clients you have. So, and it can be, let's say, 5% of the bill. Um, there's Stripe and other platforms. So look at the cost of using these, um, if you like, immediate payment um, platforms, because there is a massive upside for sure, um, but there's a cost, and you'll be you'll be it'll erode your margin. Um, so think about that. It's not a it's not a, a decision you should take without weighing up all the future costs involved with doing that. Um, agree fixed fees uh, and regular payments for recurring services. Um, direct debit, as I said, standing order is another one. Encourage clients to set up a standing order, but again, it's cumbersome if you if you do a rate increase. 
So that's something to bear in mind and think about. Um, okay, next one. Uh, da, 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 chasing debt. Yeah. Um, I personally think, and it's only my view, and I'd be interested to see what Amanda's view on this would be, um, that the person uh, chasing late payments should be separate from the finance person who raises the invoice. Yeah, it, it can be good practice to have someone else doing doing it. There are different views on this, but a lot of uh, people I speak to uh, tend to separate and have a different person responsible. OK. Um, agree standard messages and timings on chasing. So I, I said earlier, uh, build a build a almost a semi automated process here with pre prepared, you know, really well worded um, emails at each point. Um, I personally try to use humor um, with clients, try not to make it a big thing, say, you know, and use tone of voice that's that's in keeping with the the values and the the um, the the personality of your business, right? If your business is is fun, lighthearted business, then then be consistent and don't go um, heavy handed with your with your email tone. Try and adopt the tone of the business where possible. Be consistent. Otherwise, you've got this this almost schizophrenic behavior going on. Um, my my example earlier about the big logistics company, the global huge logistics company. They had a massive thing on culture and values and their people first philosophy and caring for the community and da, da, da. and yet their finance uh, uh, team was completely different. They clearly live in a, a separate building in terms of the way they operate. And there was a massive difference um, in terms of the experience. So think about that. Um, where is it to? Uh, yeah. Linked those automate your process where possible to reduce delay. Diarize uh, a courtesy call before the invoice is due. You know, people don't like picking up the phone these days. It, we're so used to texting or emailing and so on, but actually, you know, picking up the phone and saying, "Look, Dave, um, just let you know the invoice is due tomorrow. We're on day 29, 30 days. It'd be brilliant if you could get it processed today. That would be amazing. Thank you so much." You know, it's it's getting used to having those conversations and not 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 kicking the can down the road. Uh, monitoring debts and reporting. I'm gonna, I've got an example in a moment about debtor days and how to calculate that. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll push that off for a few minutes and cover that in a minute. Um, monitor variations. I put there ruthlessly. It's quite strong, but make it at least a KPI that your cash is so important to your business, make it something you measure regularly and it's discussed um, at, the, at the senior table. It's not something that's just between you and the finance person, right? Um, don't continue to supply late payers. This is an interesting one. This is something uh, Becky raised. This is the going nuclear bit. At what point do you say, right, okay, we're not going to deliver any more of the products until you've recovered the uh, everything beyond 30 days? Right. Um, that's the discussion you should have with sales, with the, the senior team, um, so that everybody's aware it's going to happen. Because what you don't want to happen is for your sales contact to go ballistic because the products they were expecting haven't arrived because finance have put that business in, on stop. OK, you really, really want to avoid that because then you're into recovery. You're recovering the whole situation. The irony is is that actually there's a good reason why you put them on stop. You just need to be open, transparent, so that everybody their side of the table and everybody your side of the tables knows what's happening and what you're about to do. OK, so maybe the decision can be or the situation can be covered before going nuclear. OK, last section, agreeing on responsibilities and providing training. Um, I, I asked Becky about that when she was sharing with us her scores, you know, um, get under the skin. It might be training about, you know, having a difficult conversation or about how to how to have that first 15 seconds of a of a of a debt collection call. Um, 
and so on. So th think about exactly what where the where the training and the investment in time should be. Um, clear roles and responsibilities I've covered. Include what happens when those responsible are away on holiday. Yeah, people take you know, an average, what, 20 days a year holiday. Make sure that the baton is handed over when somebody who's a key part of this goes on leave. All right? Appoint a credit controller uh, or supervisor or a deputy. Make sure you've got a little bit of depth if your business can, can afford that level of, um, of key people in this area. Match the skills um, of the people with the responsibility in hand. Sometimes this can be outsourced. And that creates a, a point of, of difference. Uh, you're, dif you're distancing yourselves in a certain way, but make sure the outsource provider um, performs the task in a way you, you are comfortable with. You don't want a heavy handed outsourcer. Her game clashes with the, the culture that you have as a business. Uh, fills the fill the skills gap. I've kind of covered that. Right. Any questions on any of that before I come through to some examples at the back here? Put your hands up if you've got any questions on any of that. No hands up just yet, John. OK, right, I shall crack on. Um, so, debtor days, what are they? Right. Very, very easy to calculate this. So, um, essentially, if we jump down to halfway down the page here, we've got average debtor days 50 in there. This example is the key numbers you need to look at. Can you guys see my pointer? So I'm pointing at 109K. Can you see that? Uh, yeah, we can see that. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Carl. OK, so let's look at that 109. Yeah, so that's the the total number a given point in time, because debtor days is calculated on a given day. And this example is the 31st of December 2022, right? So in this example, right, the company turns over a million, right? But 20% of that million is, is paid at the time of order. So there's no credit, right? There's no invoicing. They, they pay immediately on that. So you've got 80% you've got of that million, 800,000, is on credit. OK, now the standard payment terms are 30 days for this company. So on the 31st of December, the, the finance director decided to do a debtor days calculation. So they said, right, OK, on 31st of December, our total outstanding debt is 109,000. OK, and you divide that by this 800K which is the uh, total amount for the year that you anticipate um, um, being on credit, on invoice, okay? And then multiply that by 365, 365 days a year, and that gives you the 50 that we talk about. Now, it's an arbitrary measure taken at a certain fixed point in time, but it, it, it's, it's great. So if, you, if you measure it, you can manage it. So you might say, okay, guys, right? Um, we're going to repeat this exercise on the 29th of February. OK, and I want that number to be down to 30 days. Let's see what we can do. OK, that's the power of having something like this. So you can have a grown up conversation, set some targets. I'm a massive believer. If you measure something, you can manage it. OK, so back to the top. So what are they? I've, I've hoped to explain, but there's a, a, a sort of written calculation, a sort of written explanation. You got the example there. I want to explore um, the customers A, B, C and D here, because these are four hypothetical scenarios, but very real scenarios. I want to take them each in turn. So customer A. Right. So they've got 25,000 uh, has been invoiced. Um, 15,000 of it is still within the 30 days, so no problem. Right. However, 10,000 of it is slipped into 31 to 60 days. So there's a, a potential conversation to be had here to ring the client up and say, look, you may not be aware, but 10,000 is now overdue. It'd be awesome if you could settle that within the next couple of days, please. Right? They're well within their um, credit limit, which is at the end here, which is 40,000. 
Okay, so it's okay. It's not a desperate situation, but again, there is some improvements to be had with that 10K. Now, customer, number, uh, customer B, so they've got 24,000 outstanding. It's all slipped into 31 to 60 days. So all of it is over the 30 days. So there's a point of concern here. Also, they're edging towards their credit limit as well. So it's in their interest to get this reduced because you don't want it to go over the credit limit because that's when we have a conversation about potentially putting them on stop. So this needs to be nipped in the bud before bad habits are formed. OK, now let's look at C because they've got um, they've got something in every swim lane here. Right. So um, total outstanding is fifty five thousand. Ten thousand is OK. It's within 30 days, but they've got 13 in 31 to 60. 14k in 61 to 90 and they've got 18k in over 90 days so this is a real problem they're also over their credit limit so this is a this is a, a client that you should have be having a serious conversation about them potentially going into stock now interestingly this is doubly bad because they were they've been over the credit limit for well over a month yeah if you look at the 31 days it's quite interesting. I put this in the notes here. You might want to split that 30 days. Uh, sorry, 31 to 60 days into 31 to 40 and 41 to 60 and then have another look and see what it looks like. Um, and you want, might want to do that for all for customer A, B and C just to see how close they are of, of tipping over to 61 days. OK, so clearly um, there's um, you want to assemble all key stakeholders in your business to have a conversation on what actions should we take on customer C. Customer D, everything's fine. They've got a relatively uh, very small exposure. Currently, they're all in 50 days, it, it, within 30 days, not a problem at all. OK, so um, there's a bit of narrative there, but I think I've articulated the main points. OK, we're now at the point we've got sort of 12 minutes left.